I know there's been a little bit of a concern about uh, what happened to Healthy Utah yesterday. And so I'd just like to begin by talking about, I recognize people of goodwill on all sides of this issue have been in, engaged. The process has worked well in the Senate. Uh, they started out with a, a bill proposal we call Healthy Utah. Senator Shiozawa has had public comment, public hearings. He's heard the concerns and questions that people have, has made adjustments to the bill so that what was passed uh, out yesterday from the Senate to the House was what we call Healthy Utah 2.0. Again, that's how the process works. You start with the baseline, you get comments, uh, input, and you make changes and modifications to improve the bill so that people can, in fact, uh, support it. Uh, unfortunately, in the House side, they had a closed caucus last Thursday where they had discussion and debate on the original Healthy Utah bill without the modifications and improvements. Evidently, have taken a position in opposition to that, which is like creating a straw man argument. Uh, what they need to debate is Healthy Utah 2.0, which now has been sent over to their house. The process is important. The process would include public comment the opportunity for the public to weigh in, stakeholders to weigh in, pro and con. You go to a committee hearing to do that. Once that's done, you put it out on the floor for people to vote, to have an open and transparent debate, and vote it up, vote it down, but at least have an opportunity for the public to be involved. I know the speaker has talked about we don't want to have political pageantry. Well, political pageantry is, is I guess, a euphemism for the public's opportunity to come in and speak and talk to their elected officials and give input. Clearly, we know there's a lot of public support based on the polling, based on the fact that we have 75 different uh, entities, business groups, most of the chambers of commerce, uh, health care providers that have lined up in support of what we believe is a common sense approach to an alternative to Medicaid expansion. We would hope that common sense would prevail in the House and that there would be an opportunity for them to have honest and robust and open and transparent discussion and debate, getting public input and then take a vote. That's how the process is supposed to work, and I think the public is served when the process works. The public is not served when the, when the process, in fact, is short-circuited. Let me just conclude by saying I know there's some misunderstandings out there. Uh, I know that because of what I hear from individual legislators as they ask questions to me, and also, as we see in yesterday's Utah Policy Daily, the editorial from Speaker Hughes. It's clear as you read that editorial that he is talking about something else other than Healthy Utah 2.0 based on all the errors that are involved in his uh, editorial. So let me just say a couple of things. One, there are no tax increases involved with Healthy Utah 2.0. That is a rumor that's out there, but it's not factual based on the legislation passed out of the Senate. Uh, it costs about $25 million. We'd use existing funds to do that, and it terminates in two years as a pilot program. We also uh, uh, have got a, uh, an agreement with uh, the, the Department of Health in the federal, on the federal level to, if we have uh, needs to modify and improve, opportunities to copy other waivers that maybe come from other states down the road, that we can incorporate that. So it is true that this is a work in progress, but the work in progress is eventually getting us to a better and better uh, a piece of legislation that reflects the needs of the people of Utah. It, it does, uh, it's the most cost effective program to use taxpayers' dollars, $800 million that we're sending and growing every year back to Washington, D.C., to bring our Utah taxpayers' dollars back to help people. Uh, 60,000 people that don't have access to health care. Uh, there is not a better proposal out there. Certainly doing nothing, which is what the House is now proposing, we're just going to stop and do nothing, uh, is not the most effective use of the taxpayers' dollars, and it doesn't help people that really are in need. It does not lock the state into any kind of an open-ended welfare program. In fact, we have the ability to do with this program what was done with our pension reform program. You recall that a few years ago. The pension program was not sustainable. At least that was the concern we had in the state. And so we ended up grandfathering those who were on the original pension pr plan and said the new people, the new employees, will go into a different plan. We have the ability to do the same thing with Healthy Utah. So the two-year pilot program, people that have it and get it will stay on it. 
We won't have to jerk anybody's insurance away from them at a critical time two years from now. They will uh, finish out. But new people would come in as a fallback position to maybe a less robust, more cost certain, if that's the concern that we seem to hear from the House members, more cost certain as we go forward. So the grandfathering clause, which has been approved by us, uh, to us by the Department of Health, means we don't have any kind of open-ended welfare program. We don't have any unforeseen financial risk. We can cap this, as it were, as we go forward. And uh, not only does it not raise taxes, it does not create a new revenue dedicated stream. We have provided for the legislature uh, uh, on a scenario of, well, what if we go through this in the long term? Where does the revenue come from? We've provided them with options and opportunities of where that revenue stream could come from, but this bill does not create that revenue stream. Again, no tax increases and no dedicated new revenue stream. And last but not least, it also does not leave tens of thousands of Utahns without health insurance uh, because of the flaws in the Obamacare law and the ruling of the Supreme Court. So again, th th that's why we have a process, so that all these questions and answers can be, in fact, de uh, dealt with, uh, to have public comment and stakeholder input, so that the legislators can ask the tough questions and get the answers, and then in an open and transparent way, vote it up, vote it down, make amendments, change it, uh, alleviate concerns you have, and move forward. But when we truncate the process, the public is not served well.